we've been we've discussed the symmetrization postulate, and today we're going to apply this to the helium atom. We've already started our discussion on the helium atom, and we're looking at the ground state of the helium atom first. We know that the ground state energy of the helium atom is given by minus z squared over 2 m e 4 4 pi epsilon naught h bar squared 1 over n squared. Now n is 1 and we have two electrons for the other electron n is also 1. So this is the ground state energy. And if you calculate all of this and if you make an energy level diagram, this is the energy axis. Here you have the ionization level, which means that both electrons have a principal quantum number n equal infinity. You set this to zero electron volt. This energy for helium in the ground state when z equals 2 is calculated as minus 108 electron volts. All right, so this is the ground state unperturbed energy when both of the electrons are in the 1s, 1s state. All right, so there's one electron in the 1s, the other electron is also in the 1s state. So this really means that the electronic configuration in the ground state for helium is 1s2. And by the way, this result can also be recast in terms of the fine structure constant alpha which is given by E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught h bar c. So if you insert the value of E squared in term and you write everything in terms of the fine structure constant whose value is 1 over 137, this is something you should commit to memory, then the ground state energy E naught can also be written as minus one half m c squared alpha squared z squared into one over one squared plus one over one squared. Okay? So you just insert the value of the fine structure constant this number here, this number here, half and c squared alpha squared appears together in atomic physics very often. You should know that n c squared for an electron has a value of 0.511 mega electron volts. Alpha is 1 over 137. So what I've written in parentheses here has a value of 13.6 electron volts. So you have 13.6 into 4 into 2. 13.6 into 8 is 108 electron volts. So the ground state energy of the helium electrons is minus 108 electron volts. Now what we want you to do is we would like to use perturbation theory to find out the correction to this energy. And what is the corrective term? That's the repulsion between the two electrons. And that gives us the correction to this particular energy. And this correction is given by E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught. The ground state of the electrons, of the two electrons, and the perturbation, which is 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. This is 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2 ground state. Okay? So we have to calculate this correction to the energy. And this correction to the energy will correct this. We will find out the actual value of the ground state energy. Now we know from the symmetrization postulate that the ground state wave function for the helium atom is simply the two electrons are in the 1s state so this is 1, 0, 0 for the first electron, 
1, 0, 0 for the second electron. And this is a symmetric wave function. And we let, for shorthand, I would like to write this down as psi symmetric. Now this must combine by virtue of the symmetrization postulate with an anti-symmetric spin state, which is the singlet state, 1 over half alpha beta. So I'm putting all of these in one ket. It's really alpha ket beta ket minus beta alpha. This is the only possibility for the ground state. So there's only one kind of ground state. It's a non-degenerate state, in other words. And the energy of this state is given by to zeroth order is given by E naught. Now you switch on the interaction between the electrons, and the interaction is purely electrostatic. It's the Coulombic repulsion between electrons. You find out this correction to the energy. So what you really need to find out is this correction to the energy. E square over 4 pi epsilon naught. This is what you need to find out. Now this quantum state can be expressed in the position space and we've already started our discussion on that. The wave function psi sin in the position state is given by d cube r1 d cube r2 right so r1 and r2 are two position vectors and we write this down in the basis of symmetric states because a symmetric state when its projection on an anti-symmetric state is taken you average over the entire volume it gives you zero so you only need to sum up over all the symmetric states And this is one symmetric, this is the symmetric state, right? Where R1 and R2 are summed over all the volume. You write the ket, you write the bra, plus R2, R1, 2, and you project your quantum state onto this. This is, this will give you what we call the wave function in the positional space. So this is how you express any quantum state in the position basis. And you have one half here because you don't want to do double counting. Now you can easily manipulate this and you can, you can simplify this a little bit. And how do you do that? You can do this in the following fashion. Remember these integrals. This integral is over the entire volume R1. It's over the volume vector. This is over R2, okay? So this is really over R1, theta1, one, phi1. One. This is over R2, theta2, two, phi2. Two. All right, so you have to, so I would like to express my ground state in the position basis. This is what I'm doing here. And then I would like to put in this, these values because the Hamiltonian is in the position basis. It has these position vectors in here. Okay, so I would like to calculate this, and I'm going to do the calculation. Now, if you look at this function here, notice that uh, it's it's clear that the projection of of this thing, of a symmetric wave function, this thing must equal. If you swap the two variables, it's going to be the same because it's a symmetric wave function, right? So I can write this thing in the following fashion. One half, this one over under two, one over under two, I just collapsed as in here. D cube R1, D cube R2. Then I have R1, R2 plus R2, R1. And then I can just write this as two times r. Uh, so since this thing is the same as this thing, I can write this as two times r1, r2 psi symmetric, right? This two just goes away. Okay. Now we notice that R1 R2 bra 
or one or two psi sin. Since it's a symmetric wave function, once again I can swap the variables. Okay, there's no harm in swapping the variables. They can be placed, interchange R1 and R2. It's not going to make a difference because it's a symmetric wave function. Okay, so this thing can also be written as, uh, so this thing uh, multiplied by this is the same as this thing multiplied with this. Hence, another one over half goes away and I'm left with something really simple. I'm left with half d cube R1 Oh, this half also goes away. D cube R2 R1 R2 R1 R2 Psi symmetric. Okay, so this is my Psi symmetric. I've expressed this in the position basis. Okay, this is just a three-dimensional analog of what I have over here. An arbitrary function psi is given by dx get x bra x psi, right? This is just a 3D extension of that simple formula that you learn in basic quantum mechanics. Now, this is my symmetric wave function. Now, I would like to insert this symmetric wave function in the position basis into this inner product so that I can calculate the energy correction. This is a long calculation, it's a tedious calculation, but I'm doing it on the blackboard because Heisenberg did it about 90 years ago. So this turns out to be E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught. You all know we stand on the shoulders of giants, so we really would like to repeat this calculation. So the dual of this vector is given by d cube r1, d cube r2, okay? Now, the dual of this, I can represent this as R1, R2, Psi sin, the complex conjugate, this get becomes a bra, okay? Now, this is the bra, this is being, uh, this is concatenated with this Hamiltonian, I also have this thing and then I take the dual and then I take the corresponding ket. So I multiply this with or this acts upon on this thing, on the symmetric wave function. Now I would like to change the variables R1 and R2, I would like to prime them, okay? Okay, because now I am making this act on another uh, state. This is R1 dash. R2 dash, R1 dash, R2 dash, Psi sin. Okay, so I have to calculate all of this. This is what I need to calculate. This is the first order correction to the energy. So I can rewrite this E1, E square over 4 pi epsilon naught. Now if you notice here, I have a bra here and I have a ket here. And this bra is acting on the ket. So when I take the inner product, the inner product is always going to vanish unless R1 is the same as R1 dash and R2 is the same as R2 dash. <coughs> so I'm really taking a Dirac delta function here. <coughs> R1 must be the same as R1 dash. R2 must be the same as R2 dash, otherwise this inner product is going to vanish. So, this simplifies my problem. I only sum over R1 and R2, right? All the other terms go to zero. So, I have D cube R1, D cube R2. This thing, R1, R2, it's the symmetric wave function, complex conjugate multiplied with the in a product without the complex conjugate, so this is modulus squared, right? And then the inner product of R1, R2 with this is 1, when R1 is equal to R1 dash, now R2 is R2 dash, and I have this term. So 
I need to calculate. This is my first order correction to the energy. Okay, simple algebra, simple manipulation of the Dirac get bra notation. So this turns out to be E1 E square over 4 pi epsilon naught dq dq r1 vector dq r2 vector. Now this thing is simply r1 1 0 0 modulus square because the symmetric wave function just has is 1 0 0 tensor with 1 0 0. This is the symmetric wave function. So I take the inner product of R1 with this, the inner product of R2 with this. Remember that this thing R1 R2 is just a shorthand for R1 cross with R2, right? Now this inner product on a composite space is acting upon the symmetric wave function. So the first electron state you take the inner product with R1 and since you have a modulus square here you put that in here and then you take the inner product of R2 modulus square 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. So this is your correction to the energy. Okay. Now you also know from basic quantum mechanics when you solve the hydrogen atom that get 1, 0, 0 in the position basis. You know that what this is. This is given by when you solve the hydrogen atom, this is what you get 1 over n root pi. When you solve the hydrogen like atom, z over a naught, 3 over 2. E this part minus Z R over A naught, where A naught is the Bohr radius. So this is the ground state wave function in a hydrogen atom. Remember, the ground state wave function has an exponential decay. And the decay length is given by A naught over Z, Bohr, Bohr's radius. If hydrogen, if you consider hydrogen atom with Z is 1, the Bohr radius is where the wave function decreases to 1 over E or 37% of its maximum value. So this is the ground state wave function. Now what you could do is you could simply insert this wave function in here. You can insert the same wave function in here just replacing R1 with R2 and then you can solve this integral. Okay, now that this is something easy to do. So you have E1, E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught. Now I'm going to change the variables a little bit. So instead of R1 vector, I would like to write this down in terms of the parameters R1, theta, and phi. So I write dr1 r1 squared, right? This thing squared, which is 1 over pi z over a naught cube this thing squared e minus 2 z r 1 over a naught okay first i do the radial integrations so i'm summing over r 1 this doesn't have any theta or phi term in here i can sum over r 2 so dr 1 into dr 2 okay into r2 square 1 over pi z over e naught cube e minus 2 z r2 over a naught okay and then i also have to integrate over the angular variables which means i have to integrate over the solid angle okay so there are there's no angular information here so this thing uh, I write the integrals over the first solid angle omega 1, so second solid angle d omega 1, d omega 2 and I also need to have 1 over r1 
minus r. So this is the integral that we need to calculate. Okay, I've just inserted or plugged in the values of the ground state wave function for the hydrogen that comes out from the hydrogen atom into this expression. <coughs> okay, so everything is nice and simple here. E square, 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over pi square, z over a naught raised to power 6. This is a constant. Then you have dr1, dr2. Remember when you integrate over a sphere, you have this r square term, and then you have a solid angle, and there's a sine theta term in here. Okay, remember that you're integrating over a sphere here. Then you have e minus 2 z over r1 over a naught, e minus 2 z over r2 over a naught, d omega 1, you integrate over omega 1 d omega 2, 1 over r1 minus r2. Now you want to integrate these terms successively. First of all, you would like to integrate this term. Okay? And then everything will string in together and then you do the successive integration to find out this, find this out. Now I would just like you to see how this term is evaluated. No wonder you have an idea of how would we evaluate this. This does this term depend upon theta and phi? Yes, it does. So suppose this is position vector R1, this is position vector R2, and you have the two electrons over here. And without loss of generalization, assume that this is your z-axis. So your angle theta 2 is this angle. Okay? So 1 over r1, or simply if I talk about r1 minus r2, the term r1 or r2 is just the length of this side of the triangle. And this is given by r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2r1 r2 cosine of theta 2 half, okay, from the cosine rule. So this term you can put in here. So what you get is d psi 2, uh, omega 2, r1 minus r2 is really the integral over phi 2 from 0 to 2 pi, the integral over theta 2 from 0 to pi, and then I need a sine theta 2 term here because I'm integrating over a sphere. This is the metric for the integration over the sphere over this thing. Now this thing is r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2 r1 r2 cosine theta 2 minus half. Okay, so this is math. I mean, we've lost track of the physics, but this is important. So this thing turns out to be 2 pi comes in from here. And then this is a simple integral. The integral is r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2 r1 r2 cosine of theta 2 minus half plus 1 is 1 half divided by uh, mm, 2 r1 r2 right oh sorry 2 r1 r2 uh, because you must have a 2 r1 r2 here so you divide by 2, but then you have a 1 half. So you get 2 here, right? Is this what it turns out to be? And your limits are from 0 to 5. So you really need a, for this thing to be true, you need a 2 R1 R2 here. You divide by 2 R1 R2. This is your term over here, but then you have minus half plus 1, 1 half here that 2 comes over here, right? 
So this is the integral you need to find out. So this is 2 pi over r1 r2. Now if you look at this term, <coughs> now this is a positive square root of this term, the positive square root. And theta 2 is 0 and pi. When theta 2 is pi, this term becomes plus 2 r1 r2. And that is r1 plus r2 squared under root, which is r1 plus r2. Minus, when this is 0, this becomes 1. So you have r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2 r1 r2, which is r1 minus r2 squared under root. Now r1 can be greater or less than r2. So you take this thing here, the magnitude r1 minus r2. So this is the result of this particular integral. Now you insert this in here. Okay, you put this in here. What's the result of this integral? What's the result of this integral? Sum over the entire solid volume, solid angle. It's 4 pi. So you get a 4 pi term from here. You get this thing from here. And then you have these terms, which, and then you integrate. You can do the integration. And how could you do the integration? Let me do that step for you as well. Because I will not do subsequent steps for the, for the excited state. So E1 turns out to be, now let me do proper bookkeeping here and keep all the terms in that. 4 pi epsilon naught, you have a 1 over pi squared, you have z over a naught raised to power 6. Remember you also have r1 squared naught 2 squared here as well. Shouldn't forget those. Both r1 and r2 go from 0 to infinity. Now what you have is dr1, dr2, r1 squared, r2 squared, e minus 2 z r1 over a naught, e minus 2 z r2 over a naught, you have a 2 pi here from here and a 4 pi from here you have which means 8 pi squared coming out okay and then you have this term over here 1 over r1 r2 and r1 plus r2 minus r1 minus r2 Modulus. Now, how do you integrate this? So, what you would like to do, what you could do here, is you can slightly separate out the R1 dependences from the R2 dependences, and you could write this as e square 2e square over pi epsilon naught z over a naught raised to power 6 R1 the R1 R1 squared. Now R1 can just come out over here. E minus 2 Z R1 over A naught. Now you have R2 squared over R2, which is R2. E minus 2 Z R2 over A naught. We have R1 plus R2 minus R1 minus r2 and then you have a sum over r2 here now you can break this sum over r2 r2 goes from 0 to infinity now you can have two different kinds of integrals if you had r2 less than r1 you had one integral because then this thing is turns out to be if this r2 is less than r1 this is positive then you have r1 then this term 
is equal to 2R1. It's independent of R2. If, on the other hand, R2 is greater than R1, then this yellow term is equal to 2R2. R2 is greater, so you have red, right? So you can break this integral into two parts. R2 goes from 0 to R1. When R2 goes from 0 to R1, so R2 is, so you have 2R1 here. So you simply have 2R1, R2, E minus 2, Z, R2, A0, dr 2 <coughs> And then you can have the other integral when R2 goes from R1 to infinity. When this happens, then this term becomes equal to 2R2. So you have 2R2 squared E minus 2 ZR2 over A0. And all of this is being multiplied with this integral over here, R1 goes from 0 to infinity, dr1, r1, e minus 2, zr1 over a0, and then you have all of these constants over here, and this is an integral that's easy to solve in paper, you can just solve it out, okay, to try to do this on your own. The final result of all of this, now I've reached the final destination, you just have to plug in the values, and this could be solved for this is just the, uh, the, the integral of an exponent. This is the integral of an exponent multiplied with, with the variable, so you can use integration by parts. This is something really easy to do, or you can plug it in the whole parameter integrator. And the final result that pops out of, out of all of this is, it's a nice simple result, 5 e squared over 16 pi epsilon naught a naught. Simple nice result. This a naught, the bow radius, can also be expressed in terms of the fine structure constant. And the expression is 4 pi epsilon naught h bar square over me square. So when you ins insert all of these values, into the final result of correction to the energy for the ground state turns out to be positive and is given by 5 over 2 of half mc squared alpha squared. Now this is 13.6 electron volts, 2.5 times this is 34 electron volts and it's positive. Why is it positive? What's the physical reason of why this is positive? Mm -hmm. Why is it positive? between two electrons. So when we calculated the ground state over here, minus 108 electron volt, this is the zeroth order energy. And now this has to be corrected because the zeroth order energy did not take into account the repulsion. The repulsion or the interaction between the two electrons is being treated as a perturbation. Now that is repulsion. Repulsion between two electrons raises the energy. You have minus E multiplied with minus E, that plus E square 4 pi epsilon naught. It's a repulsive term. This increases the energy of the system. And it increases the energy of the system by 34 electron volts. So this level is about 
minus 74 electron volt the ground state so the 1s 1s state in which both the electrons have a quantum number n equal to 1 is roughly minus 74 electron volts the repulsion raises energy now we have included the effect of interaction between two electrons now spin has no role to play over here because in the calculation spin hasn't appeared anywhere but we know that this state this quantum state must be a singlet state because that is dictated by the symmetrization postulate so the ground state of the medium atom is a singlet state in which both spins are anti aligned so even though the spins have no role to play in the energy by symmetrization postulate we know that the ground state has to be the singlet state and the spin must be anti parallel to one another Remember, the experimental value is around minus 79 electron volts. So there is a discrepancy of 5 electron volts. Now, our technique is not really good because, look, this is about 34 of 100. It's about 30% of the total. The correction is 30% of the total energy. So the correction is so large that we're not justified in using the perturbation uh, approach in this manner. The other thing is that when we have two electrons, the effective nuclear charge Z is not equal to two because one electron shields the nuclear charge. So one electron does not see two protons. The other electron diminishes the effective positive charge that an electron shield. This is called the nuclear shielding effect. So you have to use more accurate techniques. But this is a good first calculation, it's a rough calculation. A better technique would be the variation, variational approach. Right, so you could do a proper central potential plus, uh, but then still then you would have to take into account the nuclear shielding factor. Okay, so there's a slight discrepancy between the experiment. And remember, this is a singlet state. The ground state is a singlet state, and you really need to know how do we symbolize states. This is something you learn in atomic physics. Now, this state is has a term symbol S. Now, what's the spin of this composite system? It's zero. It's a singlet state. So you have two into zero plus one, you have one here. What's the angular momentum of this state? Capital L is zero. Because small l is zero, small l is zero, you add them, you get zero. So capital L is zero, which means that you write the symbol capital S for this. SPDF, right? If a total angular momentum is zero, you write capital S. Now you want to find out J, the total quantum number. You have an orbital and a spin part. The spin part S is 0, L is 0. So you add S and L, you get 0. So this quantum state is labeled by this term symbol 1 S0. Okay? And it's non degenerate, its multiplicity is 1. This is the multiplicity here 2s plus 1 is 1. So this is just one state. So the ground state of the helium atom is a singlet state and there is no ground state triplet for helium. Okay, so the symmetrization postulate has cunningly sneaked into this calculation and, the, and there is no triplet state. So we can't talk about exchange interactions here. But there is an electrostatic repulsive effect over here. Now we would like to look at the first excited state. That is where the exchange interaction comes in. Okay, so we're going over 40 minutes. We've calculated the ground state energies. Now let's calculate. I don't want to rub off this diagram. What I would like to do now is I would like to find out the excited state energies, and there is where the role of the exchange interaction comes into play. And the exchange interaction is nothing but the electrostatic interaction. Remember, in the Hamiltonian, we just have the electrostatic forces. And one thing that you might notice over here. <coughs> this term is purely classical. How? Yeah. There's nothing quantum mechanical about this term. Even though I use the machinery of quantum mechanics, it's pure electrostatics. The what is this thing? What is this thing physically? What is this inner product model squared? 
the right and you take the modulus k what does it mean it's a probability it's the probability of finding an electron in the ground state at, at, at a position r1 it's the probability density okay now you multiply this with minus e you multiply minus e with this thing you get the density or the charge density of the of one of the electrons at position r1 okay this is a charge density now you divide this by r1 minus r2 what is this thing equal to what is this thing equal to this is this is the electrostatic potential at a position r2 due to an, a charge density at r1 this is the electrostatic potential v r2 now you multiply this v r2 with the charge density rho r2 and this is what this term really is so this thing is nothing this term is nothing but uh, rho r1 rho r2 remember you have to divide by 1 by 4 by epsilon naught as well to get the charge to get the potential right this is the k k term b a coulomb constant b a so this is term is nothing but this this is the electrostatic energy of the system this is something you learn in electromagnetics this is nothing but this so this term this correction is just electrostatic repulsion between the two electrons all right now we would like to find out the excited state of the helium and this is where things get really interesting let's take a two minute break so that we take a breath of fresh air <laughs> तो कोई सवाल भी पूछ सकते हैं आप या So let's talk about the excited states of helium. Now the first excited state. In the first excited state, one of the electron remains in the 1s state, whereas the other electron is promoted to n equals 2. Right? Now when n equals 2, L equals could be 0 or 1. So it could be the 2s state or the 2p state. Alright? So when n equals 2, so you have this kind of configuration. So for first electron, n equals 1. So 
So L equals 0 and L of course equals 0. For the second electron N equals 2, L could be 0 or 1. If it's 0, it's an S orbital or it's P orbital. And L could be 0, 1, 0, minus 1. And these 0, minus 1 come from this value of L. There are three kinds of P orbitals. So this is the first excited state. And we know that it's the first excited state because all the other states will have a higher energy. So this is the first excited state. Now we would like to calculate, first of all, the unperturbed energy without considering the interactions between the electrons. So once again, I have minus z squared half and c squared alpha squared. Now what are my values of n here? What should I write here? I should write 1 over, for the first electron it's n is 1, for the second electron n is 2. The two electrons have different energies, remember that. Okay, so I have 1 over 1 square plus 1 over 2 square. But all the n equals 2 electrons and uh, all of them have the same energy because energy only depends upon n1 and n2. Okay, so this thing is minus 4 into 13.6. This is 5 over 4. So this is minus 13.6 into 5. Minus 68 electron volts. So now what we have is the zero to order energy for the first excited state which is 1s, 2s, so there are two kinds, 1s, 2s and 1s, 2p. Both of them are the same energy at this level of approximate, at the zeroth order. Okay? Both of them are at here and the ground state energy, oh sorry, the basal energy is minus 68 electron volt. So it's higher than the ground state by something by 14 electron volts. So it's a ground state, uh, the first excited state. Now we would like to make corrections for the electrostatic repulsions between the two electrons. So once again, we would like to write down, first of all we would like to write down what the quantum states are. So one of the quantum states is, so you, you might argue that one of the quantum states is 1, 0, 0 cross with 2 L and ML, right? L and ML could take on all the four possible, possible values here. Okay, so I'm just writing this as LML. So this is one possible state. But is this a legitimate state to write? Is it odd or even under parity exchange? It's neither. It's neither even nor odd. So I have to construct even or odd combinations of this spatial quant uh, part of the quantum state. So what I would like to do is I could make this linear combination so I get a symmetric spatial wave function okay so this is even under exchange but then I have a spin part as well if this is even under exchange this must combine with the singlet state alpha beta minus beta alpha correct so that the overall quantum state respects odd parity. This is one possibility. The other possibility is, so I, so this state I can write as psi sim. Okay, just as I've done for the ground state. I call this my symmetric state now. And this must combine by dint of the symmetrization posture with the singlet spin state because the overall state has to be odd. This is where symmetrization postulate is dictating indirectly what the spin state is going to be. Then you have other possibilities. I've formed the even combination here. I could have even formed the odd combination. Minus 2 L and L 1 0 0 
over n plus 2 for normalization. And then I have what kind of spin states do I have over here? This is odd. So what should I have over here for the spin part? I should have this any one of the three triplet states. So I could have alpha alpha, I could have beta beta, or I could have one over under root two alpha beta plus beta alpha. So I have four kinds of states here, two, three, four, right? In which the spatial part is anti-symmetric. I label this as psi a s. And this is combined with one of the four, one of the three triplet states. Okay. Now there are four kinds of anti-symmetric here. So four times three is twelve. There is one kind of symmetric state. One times one, uh, uh, four times of this. Four times one is four. Four times three is twelve. So there are sixteen possible states that can exist. Because L and M, L can take up all the values. Zero and one, M L. There are four kinds of this state, four kinds of this state. Four times three is twelve, plus four is sixteen. So I have sixteen possible states. Now what I need to do, I need to calculate the first order corrections to the energy. And I can do them separately for the singlet and for the triplet. Okay? For the singlet state, for this state. The correction, the first order correction to the energy is going to be for the singlet state e square 4 pi epsilon naught. Now in the calculation the spin part does not appear. Okay, because the spin Hamiltonian has nothing to do with the spatial wave functions. So I just have psi. Singlet means that the spatial part has to be the symmetric wave function, has to be this of this kind. This is the symmetrization postulate. This is where spin and space come hand in glove with one another. Okay, this is where they are correlated. So this thing equals psi symmetric part 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2 symmetric part. This is the energy of the singlet state. And the energy of the triplet state <coughs> the first order correction. Remember, look in this in this term the spin part doesn't appear. But the quantum state is restrained to be the symmetric quantum state. For the triplet state, the energy correction is going to be e square over 4 pi epsilon naught. For the triplet state, the state has to be the spatial part which has to, which is communicating the Hamilton, the perturbative Hamiltonian is the anti-symmetric part, psi k s. So this is what you need to calculate and this is what you need to calculate and these energies will turn out to be different. Now the question I would like to pose here from basic quantum mechanics is you using perturbation theory here. Now are so how many kinds of psi 1 do you have? You have four kinds of psi 1 depending upon the values of L and N. All of them have the same energy no doubt. But there are four kinds. So it's not a non degenerate it's a degenerate state. This has four fold degeneracy. Are we allowed to use the perturbation theory? We have to use the degenerate perturbation theory. One. Second, this state, all of these 12 different kinds of states, these 12 triplet states, got three kinds of triplets and four kinds of LNML. The 12 triplet is also all of these 12 states are degenerate. To the zeroth order, both of them have the same energy, remember that. But of the first order, the energies might change. But this is degenerate state, this is a degenerate state. 
So we have to use degenerate perturbation theory. We can't use non-degenerate perturbation theory. So you have to write your matrix and then you have to diagonalize it. But it's but you're lucky here because these states are ideal states of the total angular momentum. This state has a fixed angular momentum. The first angular momentum L is zero. The second angular momentum L is fixed. So the total angular momentum is L. ML is also fixed because this ML is zero. So this is an ideal state of the angular momentum, total angular momentum, and so is this. And luckily, this thing over here is also an ideal state of the total angular momentum. The total angular momentum, by the way, is given by R1 crossed with P1 plus R2 crossed with P2. How do we know that this is an ideal state of the total angular momentum? This is just the distance between the two electrons. And what is, the total angular momentum is a generator of rotations of the entire two body system. So if you rotate the entire system of two electrons, the distance between the electrons doesn't change. Hence, we are lucky here is that these terms, uh, that the, the perturbative Hamiltonian commutes with the symmetric and the anti-symmetric states. So even though we have to use degenerate perturbation theory, but nature is on our side. Okay? So we can calculate these terms, and these terms will give us the corrections to the energies for the singlet and the triplet states. Now let's, I will just start the calculation over here. And then you have to finish it on your own, probably as a homework part. So if I want to calculate this thing over here, what I need to do is, for the singlet, I repeat the same kind of calculation. Okay? But then I would like to write this in terms in the position space. Okay? I like to write this in terms of the position space. And you now the basis states are the anti-symmetric states. So this thing, psi sim, uh, so, so psi sim will have exactly the same form, sorry. The symmetric wave function will have exactly the same form as previously. Okay, let me do this for you. We still have about 15 minutes. So it's going to be clear over here. <coughs> If you psi sim, if you repeat the same calculation that you did for the ground state, in this case psi sim turns out to be equal to R1, 1, 0, 0, R2, 2, L, and L plus R1 2 L M L R2 1 0 0 remember your symmetric wave function is now this function you express this in terms of the symmetric basis states this is your state in terms of in the position space. Now you insert this value in here exactly the same fashion. And you take the dual of this and insert it in here. You will get the following result. You will get, let me write this out in yellow. For distinction purposes, you will get E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught d cube r1 d cube r2 we have r1 1 0 0 modulus square 
R2, 2L, and L modulus squared, 1 over R1 minus R2, plus you get another term, E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught d r1 d r2 r1 1 0 0 so conjugate r2 2 l n l complex conjugate 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2 R1 2 L M L R2 1 0 0 So this is your first order correction. It comprises two terms. This term and this term. Now just gaze at this for half a minute. And then I'll explain what this means. So I've just done algebra here. Just algebra. Exactly the same way as I have calculated the ground state, now using the excited state. And I am using first the symmetric part so to calculate the correction to the energies for the singlet state. Just gaze at this for, for half a minute. This is 
the exchange integrity. And just observe, this spin has appeared nowhere in the perturbator calculation. Spin system, the spin part of this two electronic system. But the singlet state has a certain energy. And if you repeat the same calculation with the triplet state, and you want to find out the first order correction to the triplet state. Now for the triplet state, what you will have, you will have to use an anti-symmetric wave function and you express this in the position basis and you do this in exactly the same fashion. The only difference is that you have a minus sign here. Right? And when you perform all of this calculation, the only thing that changes is this particular sign. Everything else remains the same. So you get I minus J. So now the singlet and the triplet have different energies, even though the singlet and triplet never appeared in the calculation for the energy direction. But they have different energies. So now what's going to happen, suppose I just try to look at this diagram once again. Suppose I'm at minus 68 electron volt, which is the zeroth order energy for 1s, 2s, and 1s, 2p states. Now, <clears throat> the singlet and the triplet states, they don't have the same energy. Their energies differ. By how much? By 2j. They differ by 2j. Now, is I the same? Does I depend upon L and M? Does I, the electrostatic repulsion, depend upon L and M? Yes, it does. Because different, you have put an S orbital here or you put a P orbital here, this will be different wave function. So I does depend upon whether you're talking about an S orbital or a P orbital. So, so, so this degeneracy is going to be lifted by the exchange interaction. The exchange interaction lifts the degeneracy. You had a 12-fold degenerate state here, 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 up to zero order. Now the degeneracy is being lifted by the exchange interaction. And the exchange interaction is nothing but an electrostatic effect coupled with the symmetrization postulate. Okay? So now what you have is, you have an I. Now I'm going to exaggerate this diagram a little bit. It's not the same scale as over here. You have an I for the 2s state, 2s means that L equals 0, ML equals 0, N equals 2 for the second electron. This will give a certain value of I. Let's call this I 2s. Now, within each, within each uh, 2s orbital, the singlet and the triplet, they split in energy, they have different energies. One has energy I plus J, the other has energy I minus J. So, and which one of these is lower in energy? The triplet is lower in energy, if J is positive, J is positive here, okay. So, the, this is the triplet state this is the singlet state and this separation here is 2j. Okay, So this is the second electron is in the 2s state. So I can call this, so both of these represent the 1s, 2s states. One of them is the singlet, the other is the triplet. But you also have the 1s 2p state, and that state will have a different value of i. That might will have a different value of i. Let's call it i 2p. Now, in this manifold, you have a singlet and a triplet once again, and a different energy. Okay, so you have one state that is higher. The singlet is higher energy, 
the triplet is lower in energy. And this separation is again to some other j, could be some other j, j dash, right? Because j also depends upon uh, what kind of L and ML you have. So, but nevertheless, this is some two times an exchange coupling constant. It's an exchange coupling constant. The exchange integral is a constant term. Its units are in joules. It's an energy. But an energy with no classical explanation. It comes out of a simultanization postulate. And this is also an energy. So now what's going to happen is this manifold represents the 1s 2p manifold. So these are the first order corrections to the energy. And these corrections, this could, so I have values for these corrections if you put in the proper values here. So these corrections are, this is 11.4 electron volts, this is 13.2 electron volts, this is 1.2 electron volts and this is 0.9 electron volts. 10 is for minus 20 joules. And this kind of splitting cannot be explained by the dipolar interaction because that's of the order of 10 to minus 23 joules. Hundreds of micro electron volts, this is milli electron volts. So this interaction has an electrostatic origin but coupled with the exchange principle. Okay? So the excited state manifold is particularly this manifold. Now we'd like to write, because this is something you, really important for this class, we want to write the term symbols for, for these states. Let's look at this. This is 1s, 2s. Okay? So the two electrons, so L1 is 0, L2 is 0. Okay. Small l means single electron. So the orbital element of first electron is 0, for second electron is 0. So capital L is going to be the sum of these. So when you add angular momentum, you take all the values from the difference magnitude all the way up to the sum. This turns out to be 0. So this term has a symbol s. Okay, Because l is 0. This term symbol is s. Now we would like to find out the spin. It's a triplet state. What is the spin of a triplet state? 1. See? Alpha, alpha has a spin 1. Beta, beta has a spin 1. This is, has, has a spin 1. So you have 2s plus 1 is 3. And then you have s equals 1, j. j goes all the way from l minus s to l plus s. Now L minus S is 1, L plus S is 1, so J equals 1. So this term symbol is 3S1. It's a triplet state. Is this a degenerate state or a non-degenerate state? It's, it's non-degenerate. It's multiplicity 3. Because there are three kinds of triplets. Okay, there are three kinds of triplets. So this really can harbor six electrons. This is a threefold degenerate state, and you can lift the degeneracy by applying a magnetic field. Okay? So this is a degenerate state. This thing that tells you the degeneracy. Now this thing, once again, L equals zero s, L equals zero, because this is once again a one s two s state. So s. Now the spin of this state is a singlet state. Spin is 0. So 2s plus 1, 2 times 0 plus 1 gives you 1. And j, since s is now 0, j is also equal to 0. So 1s0. So this is a singlet state with term symbol 1s0. Now let's look over here. Over here, L1 is 0, L2 is 1. So you add these, you get 1. So L orbital angular momentum is 1. So it's a P state, capital P. 
term symbol is P. Okay. What's the spin? It's a triplet. So it is 3 over here. Okay. Now when you have 3 over here, now you would like to find out J. S is 1. Now when you add these two angular momentums, what values of J can you get? We get 0, 1, 2. Okay? You can get 0, 1, 2. Remember, J equals L minus S, L minus S plus 1, all the way up to L plus S. This is how you add angular momentum. Any two angular momentum can be added in this fashion. So J can take up three values, 0, 1, and 2. So you have Further, you can have a 3p0 state here, you can have a 3p1 state here, you can have a 3p2 state here. Okay? So, what's the degeneracy? It's corresponding to 0, there's 1, there's 3, there's, there, is, there are 5. 5 plus 3 plus 1. No, 9 states here, 1 state here, 10, and 3 states here, 13. Here, once again, you have a P term symbol. The spin of this system is 0, so you have a 1 over here. You would like to find out J. So you have L equals 1, you have S equals 1, your P equals 0 and 1, uh, sorry, your J equals 0 and 1. So you have 0 and 1. Spin is 0, and the 2. Achha, sorry, one is it. one is Sorry. Sorry. Three, one, three, one. So, there's one kind of this. This is non degenerate. One kind of this. Three here. Three. Jama eight, char. Jama teen, saat. Jama no. Ye no hai. Ye paanch hai. Ye teen hai, aunt. Jama eight, no. No. Jama ye sab. 12 states and this is how the 12 states, the same 12 states, the degeneracy is lifted. Some of the states are still degenerate, but the degeneracy has been lifted and this is how you assign a term symbol to each one of these states. And the splitting between the singlet and the triplet is called exchange interaction and its origin is electrostatic. And now the singlet and the triplets have different energies, whether the spins are parallel, as in the triplet state, or whether they are anti parallel as in the singlet state, these will have different energy. It turns out that the triplet state has a, diff, a smaller energy. So, some spin configurations are preferred, and the, you approach this relative spin orientation through electrostatic interactions. So, this is the origin of magnetism. Certain spin orientations are preferred, and the exchange interaction is actually at the heart of all of this. And the exchange interaction is nothing but the electrostatic effect plus the symmetrization motion. Now I'm going to upload a homework probably by this weekend and we're going to have an extra class on Friday at 3 p.m. I hope that suits everyone. Uh, Inshallah, see you on Friday. Thank you.